Hi everyone, welcome back to Carpe Diem Sailing. If you're new to the channel, my name's Marco, I'm a Sail Canada cruising instructor, and in today's video I'll be talking about harnesses, tethers, and jack lines. Welcome to episode 45, Harnesses and Jack Lines. We're going to start by talking about harnesses. So first off, we're going to go simple to complex. So this used to be much more common back in the day before PFDs were integrated with harnesses, and I'm going to talk about those in just a second. This is a simple chest harness, and then your tether would connect to this D-ring, and you would wear a PFD, either a foam or an inflatable PFD, in addition to this harness. Now back in the day, a lot of single-handers would just wear the harness and not a PFD and they'd be happy with that. Nowadays, I think the best way to go, uh, this is the cheapest way to go, but the best way to go is with a, a, an integrated PFD harness combination. But these are available and if it works for you, for your situation, then that's something to think about. So the integrated PFD, this is a Mustang. Um, it's a hydrostatic. I'm going to be doing a, a video later on PFDs, so I'm not going to get into great detail at this point. Um, it is um, integrated. Now, the thing about this one is it has the two D-rings. So it's really important that you wear it and you clip it together, make sure it fits properly. And then when you clip your tether in, you're clipping the tether into both D-rings, not just the one. Because you clip into one, this plastic buckle could fail. So make sure you understand your gear and you're using it correctly. So this is a hydrostatically inflated uh, PFD and uh, with uh, harness integration. So this is made by Mustang. There are other versions out there. There's other companies. A company that I'm quite um, liking their gear is Spinlock. This is the Spinlock DeckVest Lite Plus. The plus means that it has the integrated harness uh, loop here, which in this case is, is fabric. Um, it's just one of them. And, uh, and then you have a buckle that comes around here. Again, make sure you understand how to wear it uh, properly and how to use, how to, where to connect properly. So this is the Spinlock Deck Vest Lite Plus. The Deck Vest Lite just doesn't have that loop. So the plus makes it, the, the, the loop makes it the plus. Okay, moving up the scale, uh, we have this one, which is the Deck Vest uh, 5D, which is an offshore uh, vest filled with features. Uh, I'm not going to get into those right now, but once again, it has the loop here for your, your tether and, uh, and the attachment here. Um, there's also, the Spinlock makes the Vito, and then there's a bunch of other companies as well, as companies as well that make um, PFDs with integrated harnesses. So now the thing I did mention, I did talk a little bit about making sure you're buckled up properly, but it is really important that you do actually wear it tightly as well down around your rib cage, because if you are hanging from this and it's loose, it could come up over your head. Now, a lot of these others come out, come with crotch straps as well, which keep you floating much higher in the water if you're in the water with your PFD inflated, but if you're being lifted up out of the water by your harness, that's an added security feature. This particular model does not have the crotch straps, but the offshore PFDs, the deck vest Light Plus and the 5D and the Vito, which is made by Spinlock, do have the crotch straps. Next, we're going to talk about tethers. As with most gear these days, when it comes to tethers, there's lots of choices. So we're going to start with the simple and move to the complex. So the most simple tether out there is a closed loop like this, which is a sewn loop, and then just a simple clip. It's not a locking clip or anything like that, and there's no release at this end. So that means that the way to put this one on, I actually have to feed the tether, feed the clip through the loop and back onto itself. It's a very secure attachment point, but you must have something like a rescue knife like that, or this kind of, of cutter that comes with the 5D, deck vest 5D, to cut that tether away if you're in the water being dragged or if the boat is sinking. Moving on to another version of a simple tether with a sewn eye in one end. This one has a locking clip. 
So you have to actually move that out of the way with your thumb before opening the gate and clipping onto the jack line. So that's a more secure fitting than just a simple uh, carabiner or clip without the lock, but it still has the sewn end on this side. The other thing about this is it's a six foot tether, but because of the, there's a bungee inside of it, it'll stretch. So once it's connected to your, your body, it's just less tethered to deal with. Most tethers are either uh, six feet long, or you can get double tethers, which have a three foot and a six foot. So those, again, you can come with different fittings, different attachments. Most of them will come with this kind of a, a clip at the body end, which you cannot release under tension. So once again, you need to have a cutter if you have one of these clips at the body end. And then you'll have two tethers and you can leapfrog as you go along the boat. Um, or you can clip yourself in short with the short tether you fret the mast or that sort of thing. Uh, I've talked to some offshore racers. There's one guy I spoke with, he's a Volvo Ocean racer. And they're granted, they're in a big crew, but they find that the, those tethers are just too much to deal with. But as a single hander, out there by yourself, you might find the added security of the double tether would be worth it. And then we've got a tether with a locking clip on the one end and then a snap shackle at the body end. And the benefit of the snap shackle is that if you are being pulled or if the boat is sinking, by pulling on this little red tab, you can release the tether under load and then you don't have to actually have the cutter to do that. The problem is, I don't know how often this happens. I have heard stories. I don't know if they're just stories. I have heard stories of these coming off by accident. So something to consider. If you are using the closed loop, it's not gonna come off by accident, but you must have something to cut yourself away with. Um, if you prefer the benefit of a snap shackle, then that's your choice to make. When it comes to the actual jack line, which is what you're gonna clip your tether into, you have a few choices there also. You can buy a dedicated commercial version that has one of those clips in it sewn into a piece of webbing, and then you clip that onto a cleat or a hard point on the boat, and then you run them one on each side. They are quite expensive, and I find that they're actually quite limited because you have to get the right length for the boat and all that sort of thing. I'm not being, I have not been a big fan of them. The clips have been known to fail. Uh, years ago in one of the offshore races, one of those clips um, did actually bend because it was loaded sideways, not in line, um, on a person's tether and they were lost overboard. So for me, I've found, because I've been teaching on a bunch of different boats, I went to a local climbing store and I bought climbing webbing, which has a 4,400 pound breaking strength. It's actually meant to fall on. And uh, I have about 100 feet of it. And uh, for all the different sizes of boats that I work on and what I do is I make one end fast to a cleat knot with a nice amount of tail and then I run it around the boat back to the other end and whatever's left I put into the anchor locker. So this was a much cheaper option, it's a much more versatile option. Um, you probably don't need the extra length for your boat so you can either choose to have a piece of webbing, just make sure that it's webbing that's designed to be used as an anchor, it's designed to be, um, you know, have people feet falling on it. Um, and, uh, and then if you're gonna do a cleat knot, make sure you do a nice secure cleat knot with a nice amount of tail. I will be showing how to rig this in just a minute. Um, one last thing about jack lines is uh, traditionally, and I've never seen this on a boat that I've ever been on because we just used the, the, the canvas or the uh, nylon webbing, but traditionally the jack lines were also made out of lifeline wire and they were made fast to the sides of the boat. Now, one of the problems with the jack lines is that it's very difficult to set them up where you will never ever fall off the boat. Um, I did hear somebody, I saw something online once, it talked about rigging jack lines in an X. I run them around the perimeter of the boat, just on the outside of the cabin. But um, apparently, you know, you run it on an X, you have a better chance of clipping onto it and not falling off the boat. I've tried that, it's not practical for me, so I like to do it the way I'm going to demonstrate. But if you find that an X might work for you, that's something to think about. Um, and then after I've done talking about the gear, we'll actually talk about some other concepts like falling off the boat and what to do at that point. So the way I rig my jack line is I have it stuffed into a bag like that. Make sure you have a generous amount of tail and then I tie a cleat knot. Standard proper cleat knot. There's a, I have a video on showing people how to tie a cleat knot. I'll have a link up, up top of the screen there. Um, nice amount of tail. It's probably more than you need but it's not coming loose. Now, I'm gonna take this 
and I'm going to run it all the way to the back of the boat and I'm going to do another cleat knot back here on the stern cleat. Now you probably can't see it all that clearly right now but we're going to shoot it again and I'm going to come back and I'm going to do it over here once more. So I tie the cleat knot to the stern cleat here and then I run it across the back of the cockpit to my other cleat, tie another cleat knot there, and then I run it all the way forward back to this cleat, as tight as I can get it, proper cleat knot, and then put the excess back into the locker. So now I'm going to go back and I'm just going to do it again just at the back so that you get to see what's going on in the cockpit. So with the jack line tight and flat along the cabin top, what I do back here is I run my jack line back here. Now this shore power cord obviously won't be at, out at sea. I tie tight cleat knots, tight as hard as you can, tight as you can. Cleat knot on that cleat. And then I run it across to the other stern cleat. Once again, tight, proper cleat knot, or cleat hitch, if you're into terminology. And then I run this forward. So one of the benefits of having it run like this, rather than just two on each side, is that the helm can actually clip into this, not into that. But if you want to as a helm, you can clip into that as well. That's your choice. So I'd mentioned that I had seen something somewhere on, I think one of the Facebook groups where somebody had supplied these little sort of drawings or hand-drawn hand drawings and talking about rigging the jack line in an X in an effort to prevent you from falling off the boat. So I have been racking my brain for a while here to how to make this actually work. And so I'll leave it up to you to decide whether this works for you on your boat. So for me, with the way it works, um, for one, to starting up here, we have a tripping hazard because this is up high. It's too close to the winch. We've got jib sheets or Genoa sheets running in that's going to be causing a problem with the winch. We have run it on the outside of the stern uh, pull pit or the push pit just to keep it clear of the winch because otherwise it's right on top of the winch. So for me, on this boat, there's no way this works. Now, going forward, as I step out of the cockpit, this does not solve the problem at all. If I fall over, I'm in the water. It's no different from what I do. And then moving forward, here, we come to the X, and again, I'm not seeing how this is actually solving the problem. So what we did try to do is I tried running the webbing on that side of the mast, and that made it even more complicated. And really, the only benefit it gave me is if I was clipped in on this side of it, I'm gonna to try to simulate that. So if I was clipped in on this side of it, if I fall over, I'm still going over, but because I'm clipped on that side of the mast on a six foot tether, this is as far as I'm gonna go. So if I'm hanging here like this, I do have access to the tow rail, I could pull myself back up here. But it's a really isolated situation where it only works if I fall down right there. Otherwise, I don't see how this system works. If you have any ideas or thoughts, about how an X might work, or better ideas on how to keep someone on the boat in a, in a way of rigging, certainly leave it in the comments. My thoughts on this is the only way of stopping someone from going over the side is an, an overheaded, sus an suspended from overhead, which is, is completely unrealistic. So I have really thought this through, and I can't see any option better than what I do, which is simply running the, uh, the line on the, 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 around the, the perimeter of the boat. And then we're going to talk uh, in a little bit about how to prevent falling over even though you're tied into the boat. So now that we've actually talked about all the gear and how to rig it, I just want to cover a few points on when to actually be clipped in. So now granted this is a single-handed video uh, or intended for single-handed sailors, but not just single-handed sailors use harnesses and jack lines. So if you're out in heavy weather, um, you want to be clipped in. If you're out at night, you want to be clipped in. If you are out on deck alone, 
you want to be clipped in. And I know there are single handers out there who feel that they don't clip in all the time. Like I said in some of my other videos, there are times where I'm not clipped in when we're filming. But in heavy weather, you know, best practice anytime really is best to be clipped in. So I'll leave that decision up to you. So now we talk about um, different, I want to talk about some different safe zones or relatively safe zones. And those are the cockpit, at the mast, and up in the pulpit on the foredeck. So the area between the cockpit on the side decks, so moving from the cockpit, leaving the cockpit to go along the side decks to the mast is an area of danger. And then going from the mast to the foredeck up to the, to the uh, to forestay is another area of danger. And then as much as I say the cockpit is a safe place to be, in rough weather, if the boat's bouncing around and it's heeled over, as you come out here like this, you're actually standing quite tall. And sitting at the dock here right now, it actually feels fairly secure. But when you're out in rough weather and it's bouncing around and it's dark, you're, you're pretty vulnerable. There will be boats that actually have handles up here, which is a good feature. But best practice is clip in before you leave the companionway. So what I, can, what I have is I have these pad eyes here that are back Plated, so they're meant to hold a load. I reach forward before I leave the cockpit and I clip in. And then again, keeping my sort of three points of contact, keeping my weight low, moving slow and deliberately, I step out and I sit down. Once I'm sitting down, I then unclip from the pad eye and move over to my jack line. Now I mentioned those double tethers. So this is an opportunity or an option where the double tether might be good because you're uh, clipped in here with the, the long tether and then you can clip your short tether in here um, before you move. And um, that way you're always clipped in no matter what. So clip the short tether into the jack line first and then disconnect that one. And now you're always clipped in. Now, given that I only have the single tether, we'll talk about moving forward. So now I'm gonna go forward for some reason or other I'm going to hold on to my tether and again moving carefully keeping my weight low one hand for me one for the boat using handrails i move along just because you're clipped in is no reason to not follow proper procedures moving around the boat so when you're moving around the boat when you're clipped in pretend you're not make it feel like you're not be as careful as you would be without being clipped in because if you go over that can be a real problem and we're going to talk about that next so we've talked at length about the possibility of going over the side while clipped in and ways of mitigating that. Another way of mitigating it is to make sure you're always clipped on the high side of the boat. So if you're under sail, then clip into that windward side. And if you fall, you're, you're more likely to fall into the boat than off the boat. Doesn't mean you won't fall off the boat in a, with a certain with wave action. It might launch you right over the lifelines. It could happen, but there's less of a chance. You're better off to go in there. So. Again, back to those basic rules, always go up and down the wind side of, windward side of the boat, one hand for you, one for the boat, slow, deliberate movement using handholds. Now, if you do end up in the water or over the side and you're single handing and you don't have the, the, the body strength to climb back up onto the boat while being dragged, um, then we're going to have to look at some other options. So if you go over the side, more than likely what's going to happen is that you're going to go over the side like this. This is a six foot tether. I'm going to be down in the water like this and I'm going to be dragging along with the boat scooting if it's on autopilot, which it more than likely will be. At this point, I have a choice to either try to climb back up, which I might be able to do. If you can't climb back up, then the only other option is to disconnect from your, your harness uh, with the quick release snap shackle or using your rescue knife, which some people have tied to their PFDs or whatever, you'd cut yourself away. There's also that little cutter that I talked about in the Spinlock PFD. So you can use that and you cut away. So now you're in the water and your boat's sailing off. So traditionally, back in the day, people used to trail a long line with knots in it. That's certainly something you can consider. Use a floating line. Be aware that if you start your engine, it might cause problems fouling your prop, that sort of thing. It has been a suggestion. I've never used it, but that might be a Hail Mary move that you've got to, in the water you cut away and then swim hard for the stern of the boat to grab that line. Remember if the boat's moving at five or six knots, it's gonna be quite a jolt and you're gonna have quite the time trying to pull yourself back on. So realistically, I'm not sure how much of a, of a, a feature that really is, but something to think about. So now you're in the water 
And different PFDs will have different triggers. So an inflatable PFD might be manually triggered. It might be hydrostatically triggered, which means I have to be under the water by a certain depth. Or it might have the little pill that dissolves, um, in which case, as soon as it gets wet, it goes off. So now you're trying to climb back up onto the boat with your PFD inflated. That's something else to think about because it's big and bulky and it gets in your way. So, you know, the next option at this point, you can't climb back onto the boat, your PFD is inflated, is to activate your PLB, your personal locator beacon, and then get into the heat escape lessening position, and that's your best option for survival. Um, if there are boats around with AIS, uh, personally AIS might be something to think about. Some people have both. But the reality is do your best to stay on the boat, even though you're clipped in, because going over the side by yourself is not a great option for survival. So not to sign off on too negative a note, I do want to make sure that the point is that it is very serious, that you are single-handing, and anytime you're single-handing, like I said in my other videos, anytime you're doing anything in the outdoors single-handed, um, you are raising the bar and you're raising the uh, level of danger, and there may be options that will not work. You may end up having, you know, getting into trouble. Um, so you do the best you can. Um, and you have to understand that that's a risk you're taking as a single hander. Um, things to think about as well is, you know, think about maybe not necessarily going out if your weather forecast is, is dire, that sort of thing. You don't always have to go out. As a single hander, you might want to think about not going out in heavier weather that you might go in, uh, you might go out in with crew. New episodes go up every second Wednesday at 6 p.m. See you next time when I go over heaving two. Till then, I wish you all fair winds and following seas.